my experience was that I can't see what's going on on stage. I can sometimes see movement and increases or decreases in light levels. So I can sort of tell a little bit of what's going on on the stage, but without the audio description, it would have been impossible to know what the plot was and to enjoy, enjoy it as much as I did. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Tim and uh, I'm making a documentary about audio description in theatre. Audio description is the removal of barriers for people who um, have vision impairment or are partially sighted or are blind whereby um, quite simply someone is explaining what's happening on stage. That, that's the, the bare bones of it, but there's a lot more around the production. I always tell people what I do, and they always say, what's that, I've never heard of it. Even people who work in the profession don't know what it is, and we're trying to spread the word. I, I really believe that everyone has the right to access the joy of theatre. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, partially sighted in my right eye. Right? Um, it's uh, no lens, no iris. So, I mean, the iris, you can see there's like a sliver that's oh. in there. It's um, almost like a, a, a crescent moon, mm. um, but a, a fine one. Um, because, of course, when the act, it was a tiny stone, it went in, shattered the lens, but the iris, of course, tries to protect mm. the, the interior of the eye, so it comes out like in, its, in, its, uh, uh, in the aperture. You find your own connection to that story, your reason for telling it, your stance behind the why, if you like, behind the what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Then you don't need to be explicit about that because that will then inform the way you build the story up. Partial sight in my right eye due to an accident in my very early years. I have always had an empathy with those who are visually impaired. But my reason for telling this story, there are many access services provided for those who are blind or partially sighted. Though, as expressed by others at the start of this documentary, audio description in theatre is vastly unknown. To help tell this story, I visited various theatres across the UK to learn about how this access service is used, promoted and explored. The good thing about audio description and the way that it works is that it is very, very adaptable in form but it is that, it is about how do you interpret your show, how do you translate your show, your production performance, out to your audience, and don't just assume it's a, a, just a, a straightforward demographic that's all going to be able to understand it and get it. It's a bit like the radio, it's about, um, it's having everything described to you that you would not hear through the script. But people are intelligent, they can hear the show going on, so what you're trying to describe to them is people's movement. That tells you an awful lot about how someone is feeling emotionally. I've got some vision, so I can see the big kind of blurry picture, um, but the way the audio description really helps us to tell you the thing, the facial expressions particularly, where people are making eye contact or where there's a look exchanged, and that's the sort of thing that I would never get and which the audio description fills in for you. I spoke to people who had just experienced an audio description um, show um, and they, they articulated to me how they built up this image in the show, of the spectacle of the show. And it could be um, just a silent scene where somebody is clearing a table, somewhere where somebody who is blind or partially sighted would probably have no idea what was happening. There's no text, there's no dialogue, there's no sound effects, just the, the sounds of somebody moving around the stage. When we were first taught audio description we have whole sheets of different words to describe movement, spring, run, jump, stroll, whatever, so yes you can match that to the action, uh, they seldom just walk on and off. To convey to um, someone who is visually impaired as much as possible of what is happening in, in the space, in the theatrical space. We can't do everything, it can't be exactly the same, but we try to get it as close as we can. So in some theatres, like the Almeida Theatre in London, this hidden service, this invisible service, the, the audio description uh, for a performance, uh, the, <laughs> the audio describers might have to find uh, somewhere where they can view, because not all theatres have the ability to give them or to, uh, the space to put them with a direct view of the stage. Lots of charmers here, of course, describing using an iPad. Some use hard copies as a script, uh, and the sound desk, of course, and the headphones with the microphone attached, 
she can hear the show relay and she can also hear her hear herself talking and what's on screen what's on the monitor is a live feed direct feed from what's happening on stage For someone who is visually impaired, having a theatre performance described to you is only part of the access service provided by these venues. As prior to the performance, the visually impaired audience are invited to experience a touch tour of the stage. Audio description is also used in cinema and television, but where theatre is removed from that sort of performance is that we have all the other senses to work on as well. But with audio description, of course, you, you have what's referred to as a touch tour. What are the benefits of a touch tour? If you come to a theatre that you've never been to before, you might not necessarily understand what the dimensions of the space are. Yeah, you can, there's a lot you can do to, to make it easier for people who are a bit hard of seeing to, yeah, give them the scaffolding they need to appreciate the performance. Our audience say that for them it fills in the gaps. They've had an introductory an introduction before, we've written an introduction. So we've described the characters, we've described the costumes, we've described the set and how it works. From the introductory notes, people get, or certainly I as a blind person, get an image of what the show is like and what the feel of the show is all about. But the touch tours, which happen normally about an hour before curtain up, are a great opportunity for people to go onto the stage, walk around the set, have it described to them. And you get to go places where other people don't get to go. What we do do tend to find is the venues that we have that are very successful with the touch tours. You get, obviously you get, you know, whole groups of people coming along because it's absolutely fascinating being backstage. Has I been telling you about some of the, the objects that we've got on there? Yes, yeah. yes, it's a bit about we've had my own personal touch tour in that respect. Um, we do a wish list. Yes. <laughs> we get in touch um, before, when, once we've seen the show, when we see the show for the first time. Yeah. We look at it and we go, OK, what would be interesting, what would be useful, what would be informative, what do I not have time to tell people during the show? And we talk to the stage manager and say, I would love to have this, this, this and this. And sometimes they will say, I've only got one of those and they're very delicate. But usually they say, they say yes, don't they, don't they? Yeah. From the production point of view, all of the decisions that are being made on stage in terms of what the set is, what the props are, are really very specific decisions. And I think that being able to experience that is very different to somebody saying to you, well, it's a table. Uh, and it's a wooden table. Um, I think being able to kind of experience the fact that it's very old and it's very gnarled and knobbly, and that kind of gives you a very specific reality and then allows you to engage more with the style of the production. So I think it's being able to kind of have that physical experience of what is in front of you on stage. And then also the amazing ability to sort of explore the space. So understand the dimensions that are being used, how big that room is, how wide that space is. And spatial awareness is such an interesting thing. Obviously, I have my sight. My spatial awareness is largely dependent on that. Um, touch tours are an incredibly useful tool because they allow people to feel the space in terms of touching textures and working out how sound will be affected by that. You know, obviously right now we are sitting in a room that affects the sound of my voice because they, they need to build a sort of mental cartography, a, a map of the stage and, and the world of the play um, in that piece before the play begins properly. It might be a drama, it could be an Agatha Christie drawing room drama, and just to travel from the fireplace to the settee at home is a few paces, but on stage it's a much bigger environment, so we need to set that up for people. It's that whole tactile exploration of the set because and the costumes. It's amazing for me to be able to, um, you know, get an idea of uh, of the feel of the costumes and also um, have the colours explained to me. That's really important because I used to be able to see colour, so I can understand that. You know, someone who's sighted might take for granted the fact that if someone's wearing a really uncomfortable corset on yeah. stage, then we can see on stage how uncomfortable they are. Right. But that's, that could be really critical for that character's scene. And in some cases, um, you know, if you lift something, if you lift a piece of armour, got a piece of armour there, which is a shoulder. For the shoulder. Really, that's, that it's goes really on your shoulder. Yeah. That's so you, you, can, you can put that on your shoulder. Hefty. 
and, and you can then get an idea of the weight that that is. Yes. The touch was vitally important really to, to create that world beforehand and it's kind of an immediate world for a, a sighted audience so you sit in a, a proscenium arch theatre for example and the curtain goes up and, and you see the world and there's a, a first impact and what's kind of beautiful about the touch tour is that it's a slower slower creation of the world and in one respect it's a lot more like the rehearsal process uh, because you are you're always finding another little aspect of the play and introducing that to the audience members and they're asking questions about how that came to be in the play. When theatre makes you think of things and your mind is expanded and you're, you know, you're thinking about things but also things come to life in theatre. Uh, when I saw War Horse, the touch tour of War Horse is amazing and Little Joey, you know, I was talking to Little Joey like a real horse and you know, that's how much you know, theatre can make you sort of really sort of you know, go into another world. And, and feeling fear, feeling how, how heavy cloaks are, there's a cloak here if you get an idea of it's a gold damask cloak. That's the coronation cloak, isn't it? Yes. And you can imagine, you can probably feel if you... I mean, it's, it's actually very light, surprisingly it's, it's, so. It's, if, you, if you reach right up to it, you can feel how long it is. So that's the, the cloak at the top. Right. And you get an idea of how long it is. It's even longer at the back. And this man is bent over because he's been, he's, he's, his, 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 his back is crooked. Yes. So he's bent over and he's got to have to move managing a cloak like that. So then you get a sense of how awkward it can yeah. be. Yeah, so even though it's fairly light, it's, it's still big yeah. as, a, as yeah. an item. Yeah, so yes, yes. yeah. When um, the whole thing comes together, I'll be able to picture better in my head uh -huh. uh, what everyone's wearing yeah. um, and get as close to a visual ex experience as um, what anyone else would get. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't have known certain things unless I'd um, had them explained earlier, so... Um, one of the characters carries a kind of a baby doll and because I'd had the chance in the touch tour before the play started to handle the doll, I could imagine what she was holding, which I just, you know, I, w I would have just missed completely. I felt it really added to my enjoyment tonight and my sort of richness of understanding what was going on. So we've also got people on the stage who know a lot more about what it's like to do this than I do. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. We also have people from the cast coming down and that may mean that um, they can talk a bit about their character, um, what it's like to be on that stage and also um, it gives people a chance to tune into voices. Sometimes you have an actor who's playing two or three parts and we'll ask them to do an accent, their accent perhaps, or the way they speak in each of these three parts. We talk a bit more we like talk that. talk a bit more like that, yes, my lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit posh <laughs> coming. Yeah. The other thing that really helps in the touch tours is when the actors come, or whether they, do, whether they do it on a CD earlier, to hear their voices using the accents they were using in the production, because quite often it's something very different from their natural speaking voice. Um, and that's really helpful then to identify people very quickly and I always think the more actors that get involved with it, the better as well, because voice recognition is such a big part of that. You don't realise, when you sit and watch a play, you, a character comes on, talks a bit, goes off again. When that character comes on again, you know who that person is, because you recognise them from before, and you say, oh, this is that woman that said she was going to go and do that thing. You know, oh, you know, Medea's back. Oh, let's see if she's done the thing that she said she was going to. And But actually, for people who aren't using visual recognition, hearing somebody's voice beforehand saying, I'm playing this character, when you hear me speak, this is who I am. That gives them something to tap into and that's a really important part of it as well. Each person I spoke with, however long they had been in their role and working within the Access community, there was one question that had everybody thinking. With a greater knowledge and an understanding and an increasing awareness of accessibility, there is hope that theatre makers, the producers, the directors, the devisers and adapters are possibly beginning to think more about accessibility in the initial writing and rehearsal process. An audio describer is virtually invisible during the show because we're in a room somewhere far away watching the show. Uh, we can't even see it live sometimes, we're watching it on a monitor. Well then, I'll marry Warren's daughter. And he stands in the shadows. Lady Anne enters with a priest. Two servants carry a covered stretcher with the remains of her father-in-law. Sit down. Sit down. 
And so when those, no one knows that we're there, uh, there might be someone in the auditorium with a headset on, but they could be using it because they need to have the sound enhanced. They may be slightly deaf. Um, if you've got uh, a signer for a deaf audience, they'll be standing on the side of the stage. Everyone knows they're there. But we are completely invisible. I, I think nowadays there's a lot more audio description around, which is fantastic. There's a lot more choice. Uh, I still think that sometimes people think it's an add-on service. I don't think it is always about money. I think it's about funding in people as well and resources and making sure that people are trained. And a lot of problems with access, to, a lot of obstacles for access and access provision is often a, a fear or a confidence problem. It's a, a fear of getting it wrong or a fear of not being able to quite sort of, you don't ever want to offend anybody, you don't want to provide the wrong kind of service. So I suppose investment, yes, but investment in education as well as um, equipment. That's where it would help on the accessible side of things is for, you know, theatre companies to realise it's a kind of partnership, you, know, you don't have to work alone and to see what we could do to help. Because the thing about access people, people who care about access in theatres, in the olden days it just used to be somebody who cared <laughs> and um, nowadays theatres are understanding that you actually, it's or they'd add it onto the marketing department's role or you'd add it onto the education role but more often than not theatres are now actually creating that role as an access coordinator, access officer, which I think is really important. And what's interesting about that is that you can't experience the world as a visually impaired person. So you have to listen to the, the thoughts and experiences of visually impaired people um, about productions, about drama, about actors, about the speed at which they talk, about the volume at which they talk, about how they use their voice to describe things and how they, um, as actors, create their persona just by using their voices is a fascinating um, aspect for us in looking as to how we produce theatre as well. Having done the job of partially opening the door so that audiences who can't see very well can experience theatre with a, a live description, um, the next step, and in a way the most exciting step, is to find out what the creative potential of that aspect of performance might be. And I think people working more creatively with their audio describers so that there's a collaborative approach to the production of what is the audio description. Um, and the more that describers work with the creative teams, the better kind of product, the better reflection of, of, of the artistic vision, you know, that the audience will get the best kind of experience. And then it's about finding the investment that on particular projects, and it'll only ever be particular projects, um, will allow us to integrate the, um, the process of making the work accessible to the, to the core of the creative process itself. Um, I think realistically that's only going to be something that happens every now and again, but it's something that could be really exciting. I don't think one can be a successful director without having a very open mind and without actually being able to project oneself into the experiences of others. Um, and so what's interesting about a dialogue between directors and visually impaired or, or deaf or disabled audiences is, is how much experience the director has of meeting various members of society. A lot more needs to happen at that beginning process to make sure that access is embedded in so that it's not an add-on thing at the end. It's not something that, oh, hang on a minute, we should be doing some access, or we've got to do a captioned, an audio described, and a BSL performance, or we must be doing it kind of thing, and then it's a mad rush to do it. I'd love to see a director uh, thinking about um, how this reads to somebody who's blind or partially sighted. I'd love to have a writer talk to us about um, making the, the, the directions a little bit more, uh, making, the, make the, making the work more accessible to somebody who's blind or partially sighted. Any director with any sort of experimental instinct in their bones will, will go, God, I wish I could integrate that to the performance. It seems weird to have it just beside the performance. How much are you able to consider the people coming to the theatre who cannot see? Do you know, I'm going to be really honest and say I don't think it's ever come up as a conversation in a devising room. 
probably partly because <laughs> in a room where you're devising, I mean, you often have no idea what you're going to end up with, let alone how people will experience it. Um, you're often sort of like wandering aimlessly through the material that you have or whatever you know objectives your company has. But that depends from company to company. Things like where where possible and where you know you're not compromising what you're trying to do with the scene because that wouldn't help anybody. Um, where you can build in the time where someone might be able to say it, or if you're doing performances that are audio described, if you like you would in a relaxed performance, change a few things. If it's possible to change a few things for an audio described performance in order to give it just that tiny bit more time. You were mm. saying a couple of seconds is all you need, yeah. really. It's yeah. amazing what you can do in a couple of seconds. <laughs> yes. Um, and it's now something that will be in, just be in my consciousness when I'm working. Mm. This journey of discovery has taken me to some magnificent venues, speaking with people that work and volunteer at these theatres to bring more awareness and empathy to their access services. But from all of these heartening responses from each director, performer, access officer and visually impaired audience members, I wanted to build on that momentum because it is also about the equity and the equality in theatre making and the functioning of a venue which is what led me on to my final question. How do you think we could encourage directors and producers to think about that within their creation process? I think directors and producers need to realise that there is an untapped source out there, not just in disabled people and deaf people who work on stage as actors, but also uh, people who work backstage. And I think it's time we had directors who were wheelchair users. I think it's time we had sound designers who were partially sighted. I think it's time we, we had um, stage managers who are maybe on the autistic spectrum, you know, because they're untapped stories and there are different ways of looking at the world and there are different ways of production. And if you shut those people out, you lose out, your audiences lose out. Um, and the same stories kept being to keep being told. And the more people involved in a production who have requirements, the more people can feed into the director's thoughts about what makes, what makes a play. Um, and it's about just understanding that when you make a play, you are either doing it with the intent to entertain as many people as possible, or you're doing it with the intent of entertaining a very small group of people. And I think you know, there are reasons that both of those sorts of plays exist. I think uh, partnerships and building relationships in terms of the audio describers coming in so it isn't seen as a sort of add-on that happens towards the end. It's, it's something that's thought about a lot earlier on. The next step that we need to take is, is doing something about the companies and just doing something about the pe actual people on stage. They, they would learn so much, they would gain so much, their, their art would gain so much by having the the inclusion and making these these choices to have somebody uh, who has a different story working for them both backstage making the theatre and also interpreting the theatre on stage. Conversations about it, stuff like this, <laughs> like the fact that you're asking me and I'm going oh yeah maybe we shouldn't have taken out those stage directions that would have made it really helpful for people with partial sight or, or you know I I think talking about it and awareness of it comes from talking things like this, seeing a documentary and talking about it.